see our prime time lineup beginning at 11 p.m. Eastern. Our guest is Kirkpatrick Sale, contributing editor for The Nation magazine. He joins us to discuss his recent book, The Fire of His Genius, Robert Fulton and the American Dream. Kirkpatrick Sale, where did you get the title for your book, The Fire of His Genius? Well, Robert Fulton when he died at an early age, was compared to the self-consuming tree of Gambia. Now, I don't know if any such tree exists, but that's what was said uh, at his funeral. And that the fire of his genius ate him up like the self-consuming tree of Gambia. And I think that's the key to Fulton's character, that fire for fame and riches. That's why I called the subtitle Robert Fulton and the American Dream because it was that American dream of fame and riches which he acknowledged right from the beginning he wanted. He, he didn't make any bones about it. That's what he was out for and he would do anything to get there and he got it but the process ate him up and that's the, the, the larger theme of Robert Fulton and the American Dream is that getting the American Dream is one thing but in the process we tend to eat ourselves up and we tend to have effects on the rest of the world that we don't even pay any attention to. There are costs in the American dream. Where did you get the idea to do a, a biography on Robert Fulton? Well, I live alongside the Hudson River and so I've been wanting to write about the Hudson for some time. But what happened was that I wanted to write a book about computers and what was wrong with computers and the effects that computers are going to have on our lives that we have no idea about because technology always has ripple effects that, that uh, go on and on uh, for decades and centuries even that are unintended and unknown but I couldn't get anybody to take a book uh, was questioning computers as hard as I wanted to so I said let me find another technology uh, back uh, where, where, where it's not so emotive and talk about that and what effects did it have and so naturally I thought about the steamboat and the steamboat that was first used successfully on the Hudson River so uh, that led me back to Fulton and the steamboat and I saw that the steamboat was in fact the industrial revolution brought to America in England uh, they had steam factories as, as their industrial revolution but here we had water-powered factories. We didn't need steam factories, but we had steamboat, and that brought the Industrial Revolution to America. And so the book became, uh, although I hadn't intended it, a, a kind of companion piece to a previous book I had written about the Industrial Revolution in England and the Luddites who resisted it in England and failed, and the Industrial Revolution happened. So this is the Industrial Revolution in America, and what were the consequences of that technology? And that was that was my goal. You know, while I was al al also writing about all the intimacies of his life, and they are quite bizarre indeed. But uh, but the the larger goal was to talk about the effect of this technology on America. When did Robert Fulton live? Uh, he lived he he lived uh, 1760 to 1815, and uh, he created his steamboat in 1807 so he had uh, just a few years eight years uh, of uh, fame and fortune uh, but uh, but he loved those eight years but he spent so much time worrying about his fame uh, and going to courts going to legislatures trying to protect his uh, patent and the monopoly that he had on the Hudson River that that ate him up uh, that was the fire 
that uh, c consumed him uh, far too early. He, he died much too early in his career and had only eight years to, uh, to carry out the steamboat legacy. You say you live on the Hudson River? Yes. Where? In Cold Spring, New York. It's about uh, 60 miles north of Manhattan. What's special about the Hudson River? Oh, my God. It's the most beautiful river in America. That's the first thing. And it's flat. Now, you don't know about flat rivers. It is flat from New York to Albany. Uh, and that's the extraordinary thing about it. it it's, uh, it's like a uh, Scottish loch in, in that sense. Uh, it, it's, li it's like a, a lake. And uh, then there are the, these mountains that go up on either side of it. Uh, and, and there are turns and twists. It, it's a beautiful lake, a beautiful river. But because of that beauty, uh, it was a river that needed the steamboat. Now, this, the story here is interesting because the very first successful steamboat was done on the Delaware River uh, from uh, Philadelphia to Trenton. Now, that should have been a marvelous success, except that in that river, it was, it was, uh, there, there are no twists and turns to it. There are no difficult currents. And so sailing boats went up and down without any trouble. And the banks of the Delaware there are easy for stagecoaches to go on. So the guy who built his steamboat didn't have any customers because nobody needed to go on a, on a frightening kind of a, of a loud and uh, ugly steamboat because they could go by sail or by carriage. But on the Hudson, you couldn't do that. It was a long and arduous coach journey to go from New York to, to Albany because of these mountains in the way. And because the Hudson twists and the, and the currents are so treacherous, it was difficult for sailboats. But that's why the steamboat was necessary for the Hudson River, as it was necessary for the Mississippi and, and the other rivers of America. Where was Robert Fulton originally from? He came from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the interesting thing about that is that there was a war going on, the uh, Revolutionary War going on at that time. And uh, Lancaster was the headquarters for much of the army uh, and uh, for prisoners of war. And it was a, a major center of gun manufacturing. So that Fulton grew up uh, with all of this material, uh, uh, military uh, uh, fervor going on about him. And it went into his soul. It struck his soul very deeply. So that when he began his inventive career, uh, he turned uh, almost immediately, uh, after a few dodges here and there, almost immediately to weapons of war. And he invented a submarine, and he invented what he called torpedoes, which were, in fact, landmines. Um, but he, uh, he created these, and he, and he proved that they could work. Uh, he went down in the submarine, came back up. He created this in France, and he tried to sell it to the French government, which was at war with England at the time. And he was trying to persuade Napoleon, this is the great thing, to blow up the ships of England. And uh, Napoleon thought about it, and uh, then uh, he said, well, let me see it. And uh, Fulton wouldn't let him see it. Fulton said, I destroyed it, because he didn't want them to copy it. Uh, without him getting the fame and fortune from it. So Napoleon said, no, I'm not interested. And Fulton went over to England. And he said to the same thing to the English. I'll build it for you to, 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 uh, to destroy the French fleet. And the English were interested for a while. Now, the interesting thing here is that there's another country involved, which is Fulton's own country, the United States. And uh, he, this was an act of treason to provide a weapon of war which would be used against the United States as well as against uh, France or, or England. Uh, but it didn't bother him. He didn't consider it treasonous because, again, this drive for wealth and fame uh, was, was eating and, and propelling him. What were his parents like? Uh, it's hard to know. The difficulty in writing a biography of someone who gets to be famous only later in life is that all that early history is pretty much forgotten. Uh, and uh, it's, there, there's just a shadowy record there. Uh, his, farm, his father, however, was a failure. That's, that seems clear. Uh, he tried to establish a farm and that failed. And he was a kind of an itinerant uh, salesman in, in Lancaster uh, and, and without uh, much success. And it seems clear that that was one of the motives for 
Fulton in his in his drive uh, to be a success. What about his mother? No, practically nothing about her. Uh, he he wrote a few letters to her, but if if she wrote to him, uh, those letters uh, don't survive. She's an anonymous figure. How much schooling did he have? Again, it's uncertain, but probably um, uh, six to eight years, something like that, before he then went off to Philadelphia uh, to apprentice to a jeweler and apparently made uh, hair uh, lockets, with pictures uh, in lockets that people wore. And then he became a miniature painter and set himself up in a, in a studio in Philadelphia. And then that lasted for only a couple of years uh, before somebody gave him the money to go to England to become a real painter. How old would he have been when he was in Philadelphia doing the painting? Uh, that's his uh, late teens. And have then, you seen anything that he actually drew or any lockets or anything like that yourself? Well, yes, uh, there are a couple of, of extant uh, uh, miniatures that he did, which are not bad, uh, not distinguished and, and don't look as if they would propel someone to give him the money to go to England to become a real painter, although that's clearly uh, what happened. Um, but we, again, the, the record is so sketchy that we know very, very little about it. Uh, when he does get to England and starts painting, uh, though, we can see the same kind of thing. Adequate paintings, uh, the, the ones that survive, but nothing distinguished, nothing, nothing, nothing great about him. And uh, he spent uh, five or six years as trying to be a painter and uh, failing in uh, England. Uh, and you can see that he somehow he didn't put his fire into that. That wasn't what, 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 what he thought was going to get him his fame and fortune. So what year would he have been in England? 1790, 1798, uh, and uh, at the end of that, he decided that he would be uh, an inventor, or an engineer, as he called himself. And he went around trying to invent this and that and the other. Uh, he had played with the, the idea of a steamboat, even, uh, even as early as 1793. Had the steamboat been invented in 93? In, in a sense. In a sense, it had been invented, because uh, uh, there was a man named John Fitch in uh, Philadelphia who had invented a working steamboat that went up and down the Delaware, but of course, it was a financial failure, and nobody wanted to support it for a second year. Uh, and uh, Fitch was a disappointed man. Uh, was he the first to invent it? Well, probably. There was, uh, there was a Frenchman who had invented a boat that, uh, that went, went for a little bit. Uh, th there was a, a man in Scotland who uh, in invented. There, there were other inventions. Uh, and in fact, probably something on the order of uh, 15 to 20 other uh, steamboats that had been tried before Fulton's. Um, but he saw that uh, it, it might be uh, an instrument for England. And then he went to France and tried to sell it there, um, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't a passion with him at all. Uh, he he toyed with this invention and that invention. He kept on uh, look looking at things uh, and and borrowing other people's ideas, um, which. Uh, which is what you have to do actually when you're inventing. What book is this for you? Uh, I guess it's my ninth book. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, and how did you get to interested in the business of writing? Well, that's all I knew how to do. When did uh, you start it? The book no, or, or writing? Writing. Um, I, I began uh, writing in college and then after college. Where? Uh, this was at Cornell University. I was the editor of the student paper, which was a daily paper, and I had to write a uh, editorial page daily, um, and, I, and it just seemed to be the thing that I knew how to do. And uh, so after college, I went into newspapers and magazines and uh, worked on the New York Times for a while, and then and I decided that uh, I really wanted to go off and write books, because when you're working in a magazine and newspapers, there are people on top of you telling you what to do. And uh, I grew uncomfortable with that. So. Uh, now, of course, there are always editors at publishing houses and publishers who are telling you what to do, but they're, but they're, they're kinder and gentler than uh, people in journalism. What year did you graduate from Cornell? 58. The name Kirkpatrick Sale, 
Where does it come from? Um, it's my middle name and my last name. It, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a Scottish-English uh, uh, family. And uh, so that's obvious. Uh, What's your first name? John. And why did you decide to drop John? I never used John at all, ever. Uh, what did people call you who know you well? Kirk. But I thought that uh, Kirkpatrick was a more elegant uh, pen name. And, uh, and, and there are people who still who call me Kirkpatrick. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of intimacy, isn't it? Where did you grow up? In Ithaca, New York. Uh, my father taught at Cornell. And uh, if, if you know anything about Ithaca, it's a beautiful place in the summer. Uh, and an intolerable place uh, in the winter. And so uh, as soon as I could leave it, I did. How do you think you got drawn into the writing thing? Do you have anybody that got you interested in it first? Well, my father is a professor of English, so I began uh, reading, writing. Uh, I guess that's how it, it happened. But uh, it, was, it was largely the impulse to uh, journalism that, uh, and, and writing every day uh, that, that enabled me to hone the craft sufficiently to, to make a living at it. So what year did you get interested in Robert Fulton? Well, that was no more than about uh, four years ago. Um, I had been interested in doing something on, on the Hudson for a, a long time, uh, but uh, the, hitting on the idea of Fulton was about uh, four years ago. What would and, I, and I assured my publisher that I would have the, the manuscript, you know, just a year or two years or something like that. But, it, but uh, when, you, when you go into this, it always takes much longer doing research than uh, you ever anticipate. You point out in the book that uh, <clears throat> Mr. Fulton, uh, at his uh, grown age, was about six feet tall, which is four inches taller than the average person back then? That's right. What do you think he would look like if he were here? Is this, is this a fairly good rendition of what he would look like? That's excellent. Uh, rendition of him uh, and and don't forget to notice the explosion in the background uh, under the fire of his genius because uh, Benjamin West who painted that picture and was a great uh, American painting in England uh, a court painter actually for for the king um, was a friend of Fulton's and a kind of mentor of Fulton's and he knew that Fulton had been spending his time trying to sell his floating mines to the British government. And in the course of that, he blew up a ship, uh, a, a, an old ship without anybody on it, in a harbor uh, off of the coast of England. And West was so impressed with, uh, with Fulton's account of this uh, that he included that ship blowing up uh, in the side of his picture. But that's exactly what he would look like. Uh, a, a very handsome man and one believes that coming from poverty as he did uh, and uh, with very little schooling that it was his good looks and uh, the, the charm that he developed that really uh, got him his early successes. Total number of years he lived in England? It was, about, it was uh, nine years in, in England. In France? And then uh, another uh, six, seven, seven years in, uh, in, in France. And then he went to England, and then he came to the United States in 1806. And in that time, uh, he, ha he had almost no success until the, at the very end, when the British government paid him uh, a considerable amount of money, 10,000 pounds, for uh, his uh, floating landmines uh, and his submarine. And with that, he became uh, a, a wealthy man. That was a considerable amount of money at the time. He died in 1815, you say, at age 50. In his lifetime, did he marry? He married. Uh, he had a partner in, in this business, uh, in this steamboat business, who was Robert Livingston, who was one of the great American statesmen who had been involved in uh, the uh, writing the Declaration and the Constitution. He, he was a, uh, a representative of New York State for much of that, and he had been uh, chiefly responsible for getting Napoleon to sign the treaty for the Louisiana Purchase. Is that Bob Livingston the same one that would have been related to the Bob Livingston that almost became Speaker? That's right. 
exactly. Was it a so. great, great, great grandson? Uh, but a, not not so clear a relationship as that. Not uh, no, uh, but he, they they were related, right? Um, so was George Bush, actually, um, in in another tenuous way. But um, that uh, Robert Livingston uh, had the monopoly from the New York State Legislature to run boats on the Hudson River. The operative word there is monopoly. Monopoly, right. Because it plays a role in your whole book. And so uh, he, he went to, to Fulton. For, they got together in Paris. And Fulton says, I'll build you the boat. And Livingston says, well, I've, I'll give you the monopoly. And together we'll be partners. And actually they were financial equals in this because <clears throat> by then Fulton had enough money to, uh, to go in 50-50 with Livingston. Uh, and he built the boat, it was a success, and Livingston uh, secured the monopoly, and so nobody else was allowed to run steamboats, although other people could, could easily do so, and building a steamboat uh, that worked uh, was not all that difficult. Livingston uh, was a, a great uh, uh, patroon of the Hudson Valley, uh, and it was uh, a cousin of his that Fulton met uh, during the course of uh, his uh, steamboat ventures and married. Uh, and uh, at what year she, in in his life? Th this is uh, 1808, just after his success uh, with the steamboat in 1807. She's not a uh, a beautiful woman, uh, you would have to say, but. Uh, she had apparently a certain charm, and she had spent some years uh, at a uh, at a school, so she had a modicum of uh, education. But they didn't get along. They they had a, a very sour marriage, and he treated her uh, uh, as uh, as baggage. Uh, you get that sense, treating her as baggage that he had to lug around. How many kids? Uh, they had eventually uh, three kids. Uh, but he wrote about the children as if they were Harriet's, his wife's responsibility, her property, her baggage. Uh, he shows no warmth at all uh, for, for his children. Uh, there is a letter of his in Paris when he's talking about the first steamboat that he created there, and he refers to the steamboat as his child. And it's quite a warm and wonderful description of how his child is, is, is getting along and, and uh, will, will be able to, to move about in the world. He never wrote a comparable letter about his real children, ever. Uh, he, his affection was, was then for uh, his steamboat um, and not for his children. What was his relationship with Joel and Ruth Barlow? And who were they? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because we know something about it, but we don't know enough. Joel Barlow was then a famous uh, American poet uh, who had written a, a, a poem uh, about America uh, in, in called the, the Columbiad, which was, uh, which was revised and came out in 1807 also. Joel was uh, living in Paris. He had gone there uh, in a land scheme, and he stayed in Paris, and he had a considerable amount of money, and Harriet was his wife. Uh, and they were happily married, but they had uh, a, a habit of bringing other people you in. You Ruth. Oh, I'm sorry, Ruth. Uh, R Ruth uh, Barlow. They had a habit of bringing people into their relationship. Uh, and uh, one of the people they brought in, uh, as soon as they met him, uh, was uh, Robert Fulton. Now, this is in 1800. Brought in uh, means what? Well, they lived together, the three of them. A menage à trois. The French uh, gave uh, the word to us. Uh, it was a threesome, and they lived together for uh, those six years in Paris. Age different? Uh, sufficient so that uh, Barlow might have looked upon Fulton as a son. There was a, there was a twenty year age difference there, and with her, uh, and and with her. But uh, clearly, uh, it was more than father son. Uh, there there was clearly a sexual relationship uh, among them. And we know most of this from letters that uh, Barlow wrote. Uh, while Fulton and Ruth were off on holidays in uh, 1802 and 1803. And uh, it's, they are 
baby talk letters full of sexual uh, images and there's clearly a sexual feeling from Barlow to Fulton. Now we have no evidence that, that, that this was returned. Um, uh, Fulton's letters do not survive from, from that period. But Barlow is encouraging Fulton to have a wonderful summer of sexual pleasure with his wife. And he says that, uh, but he must not let himself, his, his beautiful body, uh, be deranged. Uh, and, and if he does anything wrong, uh, Barlow says, he'll come and uh, cut off his penis. Uh, he, he says this in, in the baby talk fashion of, of his letters. They're bizarre letters, and it was a bizarre uh, arrangement for these three. But there was clearly real affection at the bottom of it. Because when uh, Barlow and Ruth finally go back to America and settle down in Washington, Fulton goes there um, often to, to see them and stay with them. And when he got married uh, in 1808, then he took his wife down, and he thought maybe there could be a menage a quatre uh, with the four of them in, in Washington. Uh, that was his hope, and he, he wrote uh, so much to, to Barlow. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, his wife, uh, Harriet, would have uh, none of it, and, uh, and clearly it was a, a disaster. Is this well known in the history of Robert Fulton, or did you find this anew? Uh, it, was, uh, it was known, I think, uh, but not talked about. Similarly... I mean, they don't uh, teach this to young kids in school? <laughs> no, they about? don't teach him that. They, uh, they teach him that he invented the, the steamboat, and that it was called the Claremont. Uh, neither is true. He didn't invent it. Uh, he made the first successful steamboat run. But uh, uh, it wasn't called the Claremont. It was called the North River. Um, and they don't teach him about the rest of this. There's another incident here, too, uh, because uh, while he was in England, Fulton stayed at the castle of the most notorious homosexual in England. Powderham Castle uh, down in Devon, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he stayed there for probably two years, at least a year and a half, somewhere along in that line, uh, painting uh, the portrait of, of the, the man who was, uh, was the lord there, Lord Courtenay, but clearly living within uh, the, that uh, menage as well. Now, there's no suggestion anywhere that there was a homosexual relationship um, between the two of them. But it is known that, uh, that the Lord Courtney uh, flaunted his homosexual life there, and, and he had parties and brought in people, and uh, it, was, it was known. Uh, it seems impossible that Fulton could have escaped being a part of that uh, homosexual world. And given his looks and charm, uh, he might have been a willing uh, partner there. And he needed that because he had no other means of support. And if Lord Courtney was going to support him, that's fine. On the back of your book, you have four people that uh, praise your book. Uh, and one I want to read a little bit is Norman Rush, author of uh, Whites and Mating. Do you know Mr. Rush? Yes. Uh, who is he? He's a, uh, a novelist, uh, a, a brilliant novelist, uh, who lives uh, also uh, in the Hudson Valley. He says Kirkpatrick Sale has decoupled Robert Fulton from his steamboat and yanked him out of the flattering dimness of the pantheon of American inventors, revealing an altogether surprising character, an inspired, self-taught tinkerer whose greater genius lay in exploiting the discoveries of others, an ethically hilarious monster of self-promotion, a failed merchant of death, a participant in a long-running avant-garde domestic arrangement. Who knew? This essay, in addition to recasting the image of Fulton, offers a provocative reassessment of some of the less noticed social consequences of his greatest achievement and does both with brevity, brio, and style. Uh, well, thank you, Norman Rush. Do you like that? You know, I um, talked about Fulton to a school uh, classes of fifth graders uh, the other day. There were about a hundred kids there, fifth graders. And I told them uh, about Fulton. I told them the truth about Fulton. I, I, I was gentle uh, on, on, on much of it. 
but uh, they had no trouble getting it. They could see who he was. They saw his brilliance, and they saw the fire, and they saw how it, uh, it burned him up. Why, and it, do you think it deliberately over the years that historians have, you know, created an image about him that wasn't accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's the, sort of the Parson Weems treatment of George Washington and, and, and others, that, uh, that we want our heroes to be heroic. Uh, we don't want them to have clay feet. Uh, we, want, we want them to be perfect. That's, that's very much a part of, uh, of American history. Probably every, every nation's history uh, tries to do the same. Uh, and so the, the other parts, we, we don't even bother to, uh, to examine. Now, I, I had some problem with this, the, the question of, of Fulton's homosexuality. I mean, it was clear that, uh, that he was involved in these, these relationships. But it's not clear that it, uh, that it had a, any particular effect on his creativity, on his inventiveness, uh, on, on his work. Uh, uh, and, and it's interesting that he had a passion for Ruth Barlow because that was the only passion uh, for a woman that he ever exhibited in his entire life, just that one, uh, and, and to an older woman. Uh, so his, his marriage was, as near as we can tell, entirely without passion, and it was a, a marriage uh, of, uh, of real convenience and power for, uh, for Fulton. What do you think he would have been like to know? Charming, by all accounts, charming. Uh, every, everyone uh, said that. that, uh, that was he honest? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes, I think you could say that he was honest uh, within his own lights. Uh, the fact that he was um, traitorous in offering his uh, weapons of war uh, all around uh, to countries other than his own uh, I don't think that's dishonesty exactly, and he didn't. Ne he never saw it uh, as traitorous, and, and, and people actually uh, said it to him, suggested to him that uh, that it was. And he, he he wouldn't believe it, and uh, he, he, even Barlow was a bit upset by by all of that, um, but it but it never touched Fulton. What impact did having a steamboat in this country, uh, especially up around the Hudson and all? have on the future of the United States? When, can you compare it with something that we have today? I mean, you start off talking about computers. It, was it as important as the computer is today? How did it change the life of the United States? Well, the computer is such a uh, hydra-headed uh, affair that it's difficult to, to think of it as a single uh, invention. Um, but uh, it, it had more impact than any other invention until Colt perfected his revolver in the 1840s. Uh, it, it, was, it was decisive in shaping the course of American history in the first half of the 19th century. Absolutely decisive. Because not only could it uh, work on the Hudson, but it, it worked on the Mississippi River system that America acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. And that transformed our country. It made America occupy the entire center of the continent, all the way to the Rockies, and uh, create a huge economic machine in that area, bring in massive uh, waves of white settlers, uh, displacing Indians and, and later the Mexicans, uh, and, and stamping uh, American culture and economics all over that huge area. And it became, in fact, more important than the original 13 colonies uh, as, as a political and economic entity. Then, too, uh, in addition to uh, allowing the destruction of the native tribes and uh, the native flora and fauna, it uh, enabled cotton to be a successful crop uh, and therefore slavery to exist, to continue to exist. Until then, uh, cotton was a, a problematic crop. Uh, it, uh, it, it had some uh, market uh, in, in England uh, and, and some use domestically, but it wasn't significant. And it is thought by many historians that slavery was about to um, 
go out of fashion as in, in, the, in the South as it had, had in the North. Uh, there was still slavery both North and South, but it, it, was, it was diminishing. And then along comes this instrument that enables you to, the, to carry big loads uh, of cotton, it requires uh, such an instrument, big loads up and down uh, the rivers and, uh, and to do it quickly and economically. And so the plantation economy was secured by the steamboat and therefore King Cotton and therefore slavery right up into the Civil War. What was his genius when it came to actually building a steamboat? Well, he had a vision that, 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 uh, of, of what it should do and what it should, should look like, uh, which was uh, in some ways flawed, but it was uh, clear enough so that he was able to build this first boat uh, and have a success with it. What's this photograph right here? And, uh, and he was also enough of an artist to be able to draw uh, the inventions that he wanted to create. And those are uh, drawings from his patent for the steamboat that uh, he, he uh, applied for in 1809. Uh, and he was uh, a skillful artist, and he could design the inventions that he wanted built, and he, he designed uh, the steamboat with great care, and he carried out all, all of its building uh, with great care. He was there in the shop. He saw what his workmen were doing. He, he took care of every detail inside the engine and outside. What's this? Uh portrait right here? That is uh, theoretically uh, the North River on one of its early journeys with the wind going uh, one way for the sails and the other way for the, <laughs> the smoke, uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless a fairly accurate rendering of uh, what the first steamboat looked like. And you say it was not called the Clement, it was called the North River? It was called the North River, that's all, the only name. How did that name thing then uh, get into the... Well, uh, it's, it's hard to say, but in the first uh, biography written by a friend and uh, his lawyer, uh, Codwallader Colden, uh, Colden used that name. He said it was called the Claremont or the North River. And uh, that somehow, uh, I, I don't know how he, he, he got that idea, or he may have just been trying to uh, stay on the good side of the Livingston family, whose family home was uh, called Claremont. But uh, it, it was never called that in, on any paper uh, or uh, uh, any, any document or in any letter that Fulton wrote. In New York, Fulton Street, famous street, where is it and why is it famous? Well, it's an uh, honor that's, uh, that's rarely been accorded to anybody uh, in New York. You can name a street after somebody, but here they made a street. And it was a street that went uh, between uh, Fulton's uh, landings on the Hudson, where the steamboats, the steam ferries went to New Jersey, and the uh, other Fulton uh, landing uh, uh, on the East River, where the steam ferries went to Brooklyn uh, and Queens. And they just plowed a road between those two points after his death and, uh, and named it Fulton Street in his honor. There's also a Fulton Street in Brooklyn uh, named in his honor. Isn't there a Fulton Market also? There was a Fulton Market that grew up uh, at the foot of Fulton Street on the East River, uh, though I think that was called that rather more for the street than for the, for the person. Go back again to the year that he invented the steamboat, or invented his steamboat. 1807. And the country in 1807, the people, the names that were ever on everybody's uh, lips at the, the, in those days, who would that have been? Who were the famous names? And did he know them? It was uh, Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark were the new heroes of America, because it was in 1806 that uh, they came back from their momentous journey to the Pacific. And there were celebrations of Meriwether Lewis in, uh, in all the cities uh, around, uh, including Washington, where there was a, a huge banquet in his honor. And to that banquet uh, went uh, Barlow and his wife and Fulton. And Barlow and Fulton are recorded as having given toasts, uh, which was the then fashion, uh, to Lewis uh, for his uh, achievement. And uh, they probably also um, 
went to Philadelphia where both of them uh, were, had, had work to do. Uh, and they undoubtedly met in uh, Philadelphia as well. Uh, and uh, Lewis was a kind of problematical hero because uh, shortly thereafter he took his own life. Uh, and that was not a good thing for a hero to do. That's, uh, that, 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 that tainted his uh, career. Uh, but Fulton, uh, by that time, was the new hero because he had created this successful steamboat and everyone could see that that was uh, going to be an, an instrument uh, uh, of, of significance. I don't think anybody saw at the time how significant. I don't think anybody was thinking just how important a uh, instrument it was. It took America a few years uh, to understand that. By 1907, the centenary year, uh, Mark Twain, who was on the committee to celebrate uh, this centenary and celebrate Fulton, uh, said that Fulton, and, and Mark Twain, of course, would. Uh, had his life on the Mississippi and, and knew a lot about the steamboat, said that Fulton's achievement had made the rivers useful, that before that they were just there. This was an instrument that made them useful. You also say in your book that Chief Justice John Marshall, who was the longest serving Chief Justice, something like 34 years, broke the monopoly. Yes. Now explain what the monopoly was, how long did it last, and how did Chief Justice Marshall break it? Well, the monopoly uh, began uh, in 1807 and was renewed uh, for, for years, even after uh, Fulton's death. But it was challenged uh, at every point, all the time. And that took uh, Fulton to court and to legislatures uh, more often than he wished to go. Who gave him the monopoly? This was from Livingston. This was the part of the deal. L How did he Livingston, get the monopoly? Living he, got, he persuaded the New York State Legislature uh, to do his bidding. And he was a uh, rich and famous patriot, and they did his bidding. And they gave him the monopoly. If he could successfully provide a steamboat, he could have the monopoly on steamboat travel on the Hudson. How many boats did uh, Fulton build in his life then? Well, there were 12, uh, 13, uh, and there were five of them that plied uh, the Hudson. Uh, and others were uh, steam ferries, and, and there was one boat, boat on the Long Island, and there were some on the Mississippi eventually. Was this uh, a national monopoly that he had? No. And that's why he was so late in going to the Mississippi, because he couldn't get a monopoly on the Mississippi. Uh, he managed, with the help of another Livingston, to get a monopoly on New Orleans and for, for New Orleans waters. And that sort of gave him a monopoly on the Mississippi, but uh, it was effectively ignored. Uh, th there were other people who were putting boats on the Mississippi, and uh, th there was very little that, that uh, Fulton could do about it. Was, did the legislature of New York have to grant this monopoly to Livingston? Yes. Was it a money thing? I mean, did they, was there money exchanged to get the monopoly? No, it, th this was the idea that commerce would be improved if we could get a steamboat there. And in order to get somebody to invent it and put it on the water, you had to give them a monopoly or else they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Uh, so what year was it broken? So, uh, a after Fulton's death, a lot of people came uh, trying to challenge it. Uh, C Commodore Fulton was, was one of them who tried to, to challenge it. Uh, Who's and, Commodore and, Fulton? Uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, Commodore. Uh, Not Perry. I mean, I was the only. No, the no, the, uh, <laughs> the the man who later uh, founded the New York Central Railroad. Uh, Vanderbilt. Com Vanderbilt. Uh, Commodore Vanderbilt was one of the men who 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 began his career uh, as a steamboat man, and he challenged uh, the monopoly, and. Uh, Others did as well. And then finally, uh, this went into a, a state court and finally to the Supreme Court in 1826. And uh, it was then that Marshall s declared uh, that this was uh, odious, uh, the monopoly uh, was odious, and, uh, and, and uh, declared that there couldn't be any in, in American waters. But you say then everything went crazy. I mean, thousands of steamboats were created because the monopoly was. Well, that, that, 
that helped to, to expand the trade enormously. But uh, it had been successfully challenged uh, on the Hudson before that, and successfully challenged on the Mississippi and the Ohio uh, before that. This was a, 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 a le legal uh, assistance, but uh, people were going to build steamboats and use them uh, no matter what. When, when that monopoly was finally destroyed, though, uh, it, it, uh, it, it opened the, the floodgates for the Hudson River, although by that time there were, there were uh, hundreds of steamboats uh, in the Mississippi system and on other uh, rivers in America. America needed the steamboat. It, it had these long rivers uh, that were otherwise, as uh, Mark Twain said, useless. Uh, not quite, but but uh, but now they were useful. Where's the best place in the United States to find uh, any kind of a monument to uh, Robert Fulton or a museum that has displays about him? Any place? Uh, <clears throat> one one place is uh, Rondout, New York. Uh, there's a. Uh, a museum that's devoted to uh, Hudson River maritime history, uh, but they but they are they are sort of slim on on Fulton, but but they're very good on on steamboats, and uh, there is a, a group of people also on the the Hudson that are building a new uh, a, a monument a new uh, replica of uh, the original North River. Where? Uh, they will be uh, in Saugerties, New York. That's between, well, it's near Kingston. It's, it's uh, between uh, New York City and Albany. And uh, they plan for 2007 to have this replica built and, uh, on the Hudson River. When you went about writing this and, and researching it, how did you do that? Well, uh, there are there's lots of uh, correspondence of uh, particularly of Fulton after uh, 1807 some of it uh, going back uh, into his uh, English and French years but but not not a lot uh, but but uh, considerable records of uh, that, that he kept uh, on the steamboat operations not enough it wasn't it, it wasn't a meticulous year by year account that that survives so you have to provide a lot it? of guesswork where is it? Uh, it? It's in the New York uh, Historical Society and the New York Public Library. Original letters? Original letters. Did you see them? Oh, or? yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what's the, his handwriting uh, like? Uh, well, it, was, uh, it, it started out as a, uh, a clumsy um, handwriting with, with bad spelling. And it developed into a very sophisticated, uh, very, very fluid handwriting and, uh, and very, very little bad spelling in it uh, as he became uh, an educated and cultured man. Your book is $24. It's 242 pages. As these books go today, this would be a small book. Did you do that on purpose? No. No. I didn't think about that at all. I just wrote the story that had to be written. How many words did you have any idea? No. And what, I, I, I don't use a computer, so I don't know. You do not? I don't have a, a word count on it. How uh, do you write them? On a typewriter. How long have you done that? Forever. What kind of a typewriter? It's electric. Has it always been electric? No. That, that, that's a concession uh, uh, about 10 years ago. And where do you write? Uh, in my home in Cold Spring, New York. Any time of day that you like to do this more than others? Oh, you get up at nine and you, you quit at five, uh, or something like that. It, it, it's a, a nine to six uh, job, basically. You do it every day. And uh, are you it, already working on your next book? I am. Uh, I am trying to convince the publishers of uh, this Fulton book, uh, Free to, Press, to be interested in a book on a somewhat larger theme of. Uh, where did Homo sapiens go wrong? Um, and I've, I've located the, the, the time um, 40,000 years ago, and I want to write about uh, the Stone Age and uh, how uh, Homo erectus lived for two million years one way, and then Homo sapiens evolved and, and taught us to live a different way. What's the difference between a Homo sapien and a Homo erectus? Uh, the large difference is an attitude toward nature 
and it's 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 astonishing. How do you work. define a Homo sapien? And how do you define a Homo erectus? Well, that's easy. That's skeletal rec records uh, pr provide that, uh, and we can s tell pretty much how the Homo erectus lived without hunting, probably without hunting, uh, certainly without hunting large animals. But Homo sapiens comes on and develops spears and spear throwers and goes after the large animals and exterminates the large animals in a wholly different attitude toward nature than existed for the previous two million years of human life. And this leads eventually to the domestication of animals and domestication of plants, which we call agriculture and husbandry and and that creates a whole new attitude to, to nature and a whole new uh, way of distancing ourselves from nature so that we can use it and i i would say that this is where we went wrong and that's what i'm trying to uh, to create a book about at the moment what was your best selling book probably the book on christopher columbus that i wrote uh, that came out in time for the quincentennial in uh, 1992. And uh, I had expected that quincentennial to be just a grand and glorious uh, affair on everybody's lips and on every newspaper. But it turned out that uh, the book, my book, which came out in 1990, uh, got people thinking that maybe Columbus wasn't really all that great a fellow. And what he did was maybe really not all that celebratory. You say he never really landed in the United States. Of course, he wasn't, didn't come to the United States, no. Uh, but he did, he did land uh, in, in the Americas. Uh, and he had an immediate and disastrous uh, effect. Uh, and part of it was intended, his enslavement and killing of, of the Indians. Part of it was unintended, the diseases that he brought over. But it was just an, a momentous event, uh, and, uh, and it changed the world forever. But he himself wasn't all that grand a fellow. And so the bandwagon that I expected to be there in uh, 1992 was somewhat derailed by, uh, by people paying attention to what I was saying uh, in the years before that. You do uh, dedicate this book for Delilah, My American Dream. Who is she, and why is she your American dream? Delilah is my granddaughter, three and a half years old. Uh, and uh, she was born while I was uh, writing this book. And uh, she is my American dream for the future. Uh, and uh, if anybody's going to be able to survive the very troublesome future that uh, this country and this species has before it, it will be somebody with the, the fire and the joy of Delilah. You said earlier you would written for a number of publications, including the New York Times. When were you at the Times and for how many years? In uh, the 60s for about three years or more. Where else have you written? Uh, all across the country. Uh, every, a lot, lots of places. I. I uh, at one time, I was writing for lots of popular magazines, and then more recently, I, I've tried to, to narrow that down. I write for The Nation. I'm a contributing editor there. What kind of things? Um, uh, essays, I guess you would call them. Political? Uh, uh, political. Not, not so much journalism as, as essays on uh, contemporary events. Define your politics. Um, I am an anarcho-communalist. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, what it means is that I believe in uh, small-scale, human-scale communities uh, within confined natural regions. Uh, though, uh, these are called bioregions, uh, where I come from. But these natural regions are where our efforts should be confined and within them to communities of a fairly small size so that uh, a human can have a, a, a real influence on the events uh, of, of one's daily life. And uh, this is uh, a, a dream uh, that many people have had. Uh, this is called essentially decentralization. Uh, the decentralization of power, the diffusion of power out of, out of the centers, down back to the people uh, at uh, small community levels. 
and I am uh, the secretary of the E.F. Schumacher Society, which is devoted to that same vision, that same dream of trying to bring power uh, and uh, politics and economies back to a smaller scale. Who was E.F. Schumacher? E.F. Schumacher was an English economist uh, who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful in, uh, the, 18, in the 1970s. And it became a, a quite popular book putting forth the notion of a small is beautiful, decentralization, alternative energy, alternative technologies. And uh, I think uh, still that this is the way we have to go. Uh, and and uh, I, I have, have gotten some encouragement uh, about this because I think it's increasingly clear that uh, nationalized systems are fragile and uh, in trouble and that uh, we, we had better bring power back down to the people at a human scale uh, if we want to uh, have a, an efficient and survivable future. We only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Robert Fulton had a not too comfortable ending to his life, age 50, 1815, when he died. You say there was this facial boil that even closed an eye. Can he, what was that all about? Don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, he, he had several uh, episodes of that kind of thing. Uh, he ended dying essentially of, of pneumonia. Uh, it was called various other kinds of things at the time, but that, that's how we would think of it now. Uh, and uh, he, he didn't take care of himself, uh, in short. And, and again, uh, that fire in his soul was driving him uh, to, uh, to achieve this and that and, and, and more fame and more fortune. Uh, he, he had a restless soul that, that, that would not uh, even learn to take care of his own health. What did he leave his wife? And his kids. Well, that's that's a question. It's uh, it's not certain what he left. There is no will. We don't know. Uh, it, what is certain is that ten years after his death, they were destitute. And it's not certain uh, where that money went to. Uh, probably uh, his widow had some of it, uh, and she married a, a rather unscrupulous man who might have uh, uh, taken it all for himself. But what is clear is that his family was destitute within 10 years after his death. When you finished your book, did you end up liking him? Not much. Not much. Were you surprised I, I, about that? I, I think I would have been overcome by his charm if I, if I in fact, met him. Um, you know, I, get, I had no idea at the beginning that, that he was quite the scalawag that, that he was. Did he get the fame that he wanted? He, he certainly alive? got it, yes. And, uh, and he is known to this day to, but to every child in America, I believe. Uh, and that is a, a considerable uh, amount of, of fame. And Fulton Street is uh, still there, plowing through uh, the middle of Manhattan. This is the cover of the book. It's called The Fire of His Genius. Robert Fulton is the subject. And our guest has been Kirkpatrick Sale. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> For a transcript of this book notes, call 1-800-777-TEXT. For a video copy, call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. To learn more about book notes, visit us on the World Wide Web at booknotes.org. Next week on Book Notes, our guest is Laura Claridge, author of Norman Rockwell, A Life.